Well, thank you so much for inviting me here tonight and uh, look forward to sharing with you some of my passion. And uh, I've titled this uh, The Case for the All-Electric Building because I think that is where we, we need to be heading. So uh, I am Peter Ewers, as Martin said. I've got a small architecture firm right in downtown Golden called Ewers Architecture. I know, it's a pretty brilliant name, right? Uh, and there are five of us. We uh, practice residential and commercial architecture with uh, a large emphasis on sustainable design. And uh, just uh, on Earth Day of this year, we announced that all of our projects going forward, whether they're new buildings or major uh, additions and remodels, will be focusing on net zero energy and, uh, and making our buildings all electric. We feel like we need to do that now. And so that's why I'll be sharing with you tonight. So our times are changing, and our views on sustainability are changing, and our technology is changing. Our ability to address global warming is changing. And to understand all of these changes, we can look at the Prius and the Tesla automobiles. I think we're changing from a Prius world to a Tesla world. This is my 2004 Toyota Prius that I got in December of 2003. Uh, it was a car that really got noticed. It changed the way we looked at fuel economy, uh, at cars, at the future. Uh, it won 2004 Car of the Year. Uh, when I was driving it down the street, strangers would look at me. They would come up and talk to me. My friends wanted to drive it, and valets did not want to touch it. They said, I don't know how to drive that new thing, just park it right over here. And... Uh, You're good, I just need to okay. lower the... Okay. So, it got, uh, it ushered in a new era of fuel efficiency. It got over 50 miles to the gallon, so it was smarter than the smart car. The best part was the Prius taught people how to drive in order to save energy. So by giving real-time feedback on the current fuel efficiency, uh, it taught and encouraged drivers to uh, not to accelerate too quickly, because that would diminish your gas mileage, right? And that's why you bought the car. When you coast down a hill or towards that uh, red light a block away, you take your foot off the gas and you coast and your miles per gallon would peg out at 99.9. .9. You know, that's as high as the, the readout would go. So it's kind of fun. It was like a, like a little video game right there, uh, right there in our car. So uh, it, it, uh, it encouraged us to go as low as we could in gas mileage and they actually coined a term for, uh, for that. It's called the Prius effect. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of that. Uh, and the Prius effect is, this is a definition I found online, it's a phenomenon coined when the hybrid Toyota Prius introduced real-time feedback on gasoline consumption. It was observed and documented that drivers would respond to the data by driving in a manner that decreased fuel consumption. And I guarantee it changed how I drove. So we took that technology into our buildings too. We created dashboards in, our, in the lobbies of buildings to show how much energy the building is using or saving or how much the photovoltaic panels on the roof are producing. So for the early 2000s, the Prius was what we needed. It showed us that we can reduce our fuel usage. Well, I've heard it said that if you're going the wrong way, slowing down is not the answer you have to turn around and head the other direction. Well, the Prius slowed us down, and that was a good thing. I used less gasoline, but I still used gasoline. So perhaps that was the best we could do 15 years ago, but we could do better now. So in September 2018, I traded in my 15-year-old Prius for a Tesla Model 3. I felt like it was the right thing to do, I wanted to invest in the new generation of automobiles. I wanted to wean myself from gasoline. And I, I'm not a salesperson for Tesla or Elon Musk, but uh, I know there are other electric vehicles out there that deserve a claim. They're doing great things, but I bought the Tesla, so that's what I'm talking about. The first time I stepped into a Tesla is 
after I handed over a check for $54,000 for that Model 3. I didn't buy the car because uh, I, I liked it, I hadn't test driven, uh, I had never even seen one in real life, just a photograph. I hadn't even read very much about it, but I bought it because I, convinc I was convinced this is the future that we need to invest in. It also helped that I got like $12,000 in tax rebates, but uh, uh, so my final cost was around $42,000, but that was still about double what I paid for my Prius 15 years earlier. We need to do something about that. We need to bring those costs down. I don't think I could have made a better investment though. This is an investment in our earth, in our climate, and for our future. Driving an electric vehicle is a little different experience. I had become accustomed to my Prius and, and uh, accelerating slowly to save energy, right? Uh, and I was okay being one of the slower cars on the road, but no, I do not subscribe to some of those crass reviews that say that somehow the Prius diminished my manhood. When I drove my Tesla for the first time, the car seemed to like leap forward with, with like boundless energy. It was, it was truly amazing. And it was, um, when I hit that accelerator, it was like my car had great joy and, and, uh, uh, and, and just uh, ready, to, ready to respond. I was surprised, I was delighted. I actually laughed out loud when you hit that accelerator and you feel that, uh, that I never felt in my, in my Prius. I remember uh, when I was driving home after getting the car and uh, I was first in, on the first line at the stoplight and there was a car next to me and, and uh, when the light turned green, I floored the accelerator and it just rocketed forward till, until I hit 55 miles per hour, about four seconds. And I looked in my rear view mirror and all the other cars were still back in the intersection. I laughed so hard all the rest of the way home. It was, uh, and, and I still like, I've had it for, what, I don't know, six, eight months now, 10 months. And I still, I love driving. It's, it's uh, I feel like a kid again. And I'm certainly not a kid. Uh, <clears throat> so whereas the Prius taught us how to drive to save gas, the Tesla seems to beckon us to have fun. The feedback on how much fuel we're using is reduced to a little green and black bar. Uh, when it shows green, it means we're, we have our foot off the accelerator and we're coasting and charging the battery. When it's black, we're using some of the battery. But the exhilaration of being sucked backwards into your seat when you hit the accelerator, that's encouraging us to use it. It's encouraging us to, to accelerate fast. Now, some might say that's like encouraging bad behavior because we know that, yes, when I accelerate really fast, I'm using more energy. But the Tesla Model 3 gets 126 miles per gallon equivalent. It's already doubled the fuel efficiency of the Prius. So the difference is already made, right? I mean, we can, we can have it both ways. We can, we can have this powerful automobile and have fun and be uh, using, using electricity in a really, really meaningful way. So I think we need to coin another term. I call this the Tesla effect. And here's my definition. The phenomenon that the electric automobile can use raw energy more efficiently while providing an exhilarating feeling of power, thereby allowing the user to maximize the convenience of the machine while reducing carbon emissions, especially when coupled with renewable generation of electric power. But that's not my real message tonight. That encapsulates what we're going to talk about, but I'm not just telling everyone to go out and buy an electric car. That, yeah, that might help a little bit, but there's a bigger picture. There's a much, much bigger picture. So let's look at where our electricity usage is heading, where we've come from, where we're going. This slide is a chart uh, of our total energy consumption in the United States from 1950 to present, okay? Now this is where we were in 2004. When, I, when the Toyota Prius first came out, or at least that, that rendition of it. That was pretty much the peak of our energy usage in the United States. Now you can see uh, 15 years later, this is where we are. 
you see it's a slight downward trend. I mean, that's exciting. You see it, it's been going up, 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 up. And then in the last few, the last 15 years, our totally en total energy usage in the United States has dropped a little bit. And look at this. The renewables, that's the green at the top, the, the renewables uh, are increasing. We've about doubled that in the last 15 years, the energy production from renewable, uh, primarily wind and solar. And then we look at the three bottom bars, that's coal and natural gas and petroleum. Those have actually, if you look at the top of the red, the red there, it's trending downwards slightly. Okay, that's, that's a good thing. So now let's look at another, another chart here. This is the trend, this is uh, 2001 versus 2019, and the total electricity used in the United States. The previous slide was total energy, so that would have included gasoline and such. So look at this. The overall electricity usage in the United States is also trending downward. That's a good thing This over the last 18 years. This is really exciting. The coal has decreased by more than 50% in the last, 50, the last 18 years. Very exciting. Natural gas has increased. That's mostly offsetting the coal using more uh, natural gas power plants rather than coal-fired power plants. It's a good stepping stone. Still heading, it's still heading the wrong direction, but slowing down. So that's kind of the, the Prius effect maybe taking, a, taking hold there. Nuclear and hydro, you can see on the left side and on the right side, the yellow and red bars, they're staying about the same. They're, they haven't really changed in the, in the recent years, but here's the exciting stuff. Wind. Wind didn't even show up on that chart in 2001, and look at now, now it is producing as much electricity from wind in the United States as we produce from, uh, from hydroelectric. Very exciting. And this, solar. Solar is now Actually, you can see it on the map. Uh, maybe in 2001, there was a little bit, but not enough to make a blip on that chart. So we now are generating meaningful amounts of electricity in the United States from wind and solar. Long way to go, but they're coming. So what is our future? I think it is electricity. I think we've got to invest in electricity. And here's, here's some, uh, some interesting tidbits. This was an article in the Denver Post a year and a half ago. This was January of 2018 that Excel had put out asking for bids for third-party companies to, uh, to generate electricity. And uh, they received 450 bids, which was huge, but uh, I think 380 of them were from, uh, from solar and wind power. And the bids that they got were much lower than expected. Here's a, an excerpt from the, from the article. It says here at the top that, uh, that they were hoping that if wind could come in at $20 per megawatt hour and solar could come in at $30 per megawatt hour, that that would mean that they are, uh, they are going to be able to offset coal with those. And what happened was, was wind came in at an average of $18 per megawatt hour, and solar came in at an average of $29.50 per megawatt hour. So that means they came in lower than expected, and those are the averages, so they had bids that were even lower than that. And this is solar and wind plus storage. So these had battery storage uh, to, to, uh, to uh, last through nighttime for solar or times of low wind for, uh, uh, for the wind power. Now here's the Here's the best part at the bottom of the article. It says, what stands out about the response that Excel received is that wind sources with storage are now cheaper than coal generation, and solar plus storage is cheaper than about 75% of coal generation in our state. That means that wind and solar have arrived. We can use them, and Excel can use them, power companies can use them reliably as a cheap energy source to generate our electricity. So this is right off Excel's website. This is what they're saying now. This is off their, their website just in the last week or so. They are dedicated to becoming carbon-free by 2050. That's 100% renewables by 2050. Now 2050 might seem like a long way off, 40 year, or 30 years, sorry, uh, 30 years from now, but I hope the buildings that we're designing are gonna last more than 30 years, and even the systems we're putting in our buildings are gonna last more than 30 years. But, so don't look at 2050, look at the, la the second part of that. It says 80% less carbon by 2030. That's 10 years from now, 
XL Energy producing all the power uh, in, in the, a major part of the power in, in Colorado and our part of the state is going to be 80% renewable in 10 years. And here's the thing. It's, these are levels that they are reaching that they never imagined a decade ago. 10 years ago, we would have said, no way are we going to do that. No way can we get there that quickly. And now we are getting there that quickly. So here's the thing. Electricity is changing. And it's changing faster than we thought. Electricity is becoming 100% renewable. And it must become 100% renewable. And we must utilize that 100%. So if we're still making electricity, or if we're still pouring gasoline into our cars and natural gas into our furnaces, then we're missing a huge opportunity. If we can create electricity by using only renewable sources, then we need to use only electric systems in everything we do. So what can we do to help? You know, it's great to say that, but what does that mean for our lives? Well, I'm an architect, so I'm looking for, uh, for things that have uh, solutions having to do with buildings and design. And we know that buildings use 40% of our primary energy in the United States and 70% of electricity. So as a building designer, as other building profes professionals that might be, maybe you've got some contractors or people who you know, buy buildings, uh, develop, we can make a difference with what we do with our buildings. So I do believe that architecture can make a difference. Here are three things. So we can create all electric buildings. We can use high efficiency electric systems. And we can create net zero energy buildings. Those are the three things that, that we are focused on. So net zero energy is a big buzzword these days. I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but here's, here's my definition of net zero energy. And it's a little different than, than some other definitions I've seen out there. My definition of net zero energy is a building which uses only electricity and offsets all electricity used in the building with renewable energy created on site or nearby calculated on an annual basis. That is what we are focused on at Ewers Architecture. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, and uh, so, some, some definitions uh, allow you to use, say, natural gas in the building for heat and then offset that natural gas with increased levels of photovoltaics. Uh, so generate more electricity than you need, put that into the grid, but still use natural gas. I say we've got to stop that definition. We need to, we need to go with, with all, all electric. Um, also, I, I really like the definition of using, uh, using renewables uh, that are created, renewable electricity created on site or nearby. So uh, at my house in Golden, big trees all around. I've had buglet solar come out and look at it and they're like, sorry, Peter, there's just no place on your property that we can put, uh, we can put solar panels. So uh, fortunately, City of Golden voted in last year uh, to have a solar garden. So I'm waiting, waiting, waiting for that solar garden to, to go up so I can invest in that solar garden because I can't invest in photovoltaics on my house. So uh, the solar garden uh, is a way to get that electricity generated nearby. And then little by little, we're working on making an all electric house so that we can be net zero energy uh, at our house, even though we don't have photovoltaics. Uh, I don't agree with buying the electricity you know, way far away uh, just, to, just for the to be able to say your net zero energy. I think it's gotta be on site or nearby. So uh, there are other people, other great organizations out there doing things around net zero energy. Uh, the Zero Code, this is put out by Architecture 2030, a uh, great, uh, great organization that is uh, working with architects to create net zero energy buildings uh, by 2030. I'm here to say we can do that in 2019, and, and that's what we need to be doing. But the zero code is a way to quantify uh, that, that you can create a net zero energy building. And they're relying on local, uh, local jurisdictions to, uh, to enact this and to enforce this. So here's something straight off the, the Zero Code website. They've got some interesting things to say. They say that uh, they're predicting that the uh, urban growth uh, 
by 2060, so 40 years from now, two out of every three, three people will live in cities, that we're having a migration towards cities. And so with that, they predict that by 2060, we're gonna double the amount of building stock in the entire world. So all the square footage we have in buildings right now, we're gonna build that again over the next 40 years. That is 2.5 trillion square feet of buildings and it's the equivalent of adding an entire city of New York to the planet every 34 days for the next 40 years. It's pretty astounding. They go on to say here at the bottom, I'll read this for you, it says, only by eliminating CO2 emissions from new building uh, operations will we begin to reduce building sector emissions before they are locked in for the foreseeable future. That's the key. If we build a building and we're putting natural gas into the heat, then we're locking in that natural gas to be used for the life of the system, for the life of the building. So we've got to stop building buildings that use CO2 emissions and not lock in that. Instead, that, let's get locked into electricity because we know electricity is the future and that is becoming renewable. Natural gas, coal, they're not becoming more renewable. And that is why the all-electric building is so important. So I want to look at uh, net zero energy a little bit more. Uh, I think just about any building, certainly any building that Ewer's architecture designs can be net zero energy. We're a firm of five. We're not going to be doing a 100-story skyscraper. We're not going to be designing uh, even an, an airport. Uh, there are some buildings that are going to have a lot more difficult time becoming net zero energy. So that architecture 2030, uh, that, uh, that challenge to build buildings uh, net zero energy by 2030, great. Big architecture firms that are doing big buildings, you know, keep working towards that. The buildings that are uh, residents, small commercial buildings, even mid-sized commercial buildings, we can build net zero. This is a, a school that Ewers Architecture designed, opened two years ago down in Castle Rock. Uh, it's the Renaissance uh, Charter School. It's 40,000 square feet, has about 400 students, and would be very near net zero energy had those roofs not all been empty but full of photovoltaic panels. They're designed for photovoltaic panels. This is a building on a very tight budget. So if we can do this on a tight budget, we can do it. Uh, this building, if, it, if we could have increased the budget by 5%, they could have put the 185 kW system on those empty roofs. We're still hoping that, that they, will, they will get that photovoltaic on so that we can have uh, that school be very near net zero energy. Here's another school we designed. This is in Liberia, Africa. This is about an 80,000 square foot school. They're at about four degrees north latitude. So they are near the equator, very mild climate, uh, a little warm at times. I was there in February and that was about their hottest, their hottest spell right before the rainy season. But, but they don't have air conditioning. They don't, certainly don't need heating. Uh, but they don't, they don't use cooling. They use uh, breezes, the ceiling fans, so uh, pretty light loads and you can see how few photovoltaic panels are required on that roof in order to get them to be net zero energy. And our electrical engineer guaranteed us those, that was more PV than was needed to make that school net zero energy. And that is now under construction. If you wanna to donate to it, uh, let me know. Uh, so I wanna spend just a little bit of time talking about a net zero, how to create a net zero energy building. It's really four simple, simple steps. Uh, I've, I've lectured on this before. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I want you to know how simple it is. First of all, we've got to design around nature. We've got to, uh, we've got to design for the sun. We've got to use the sun for, for uh, heating in the, su in the winter. We've got to cut out the sun in the summer. We've got to design for natural breezes to flow through the building. Uh, the uh, evergreen trees on the north side to block that north wind is great. Maybe some deciduous trees on the south side, but design smart. We know how to do this. We've been doing this for centuries. Second, we've got to maximize our insulation and minimize our air leakage. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, some te technology that's out there to help with this, but uh, code minimum is just not, code minimum is getting 
uh, higher and higher, which is great for the people that are just going to meet code minimum. But I'm here to tell you, it, our designs never are code minimum. Uh, it's more like pretty much double code. We're, we're R40 in the walls and R80 in the roof. And get that exterior envelope as tight, tight, tight as you can. And that is going to, that's going to help uh, that, so that we don't have to put in big systems for the heating and cooling. And so that's when uh, the third step is using very efficient all electric systems in, in the building. This isn't just a residence, this works, for, uh, this works for commercial buildings as well. So do those three things and do them really, really well. And then, and only then, think about adding the photovoltaic panels to your roof or whatever, over the parking. Uh, but if you don't do those first three things well, you're never gonna get to net zero. Sure, you can put some photovoltaics on and it'll cut down your, uh, it, it, it'll generate some electricity and cut down your bill. But, uh, but what we really need is we need to do those first th three things well. So before you put money into PV, put money into those first three things. So I wanna step through uh, this we're gonna specifically look at residences, okay? It's a simple building. Most of us uh, have spent some time in a, in a home, right? And uh, so what, we, what I'd like to look at is how we create that to be all electric. So this, this third step there, using the efficient all electric systems, we're taking that third step and we're gonna expand on that now uh, for a little bit. So these are the systems that we typically in the past have turned to natural gas for, right? Building heat. That's a big one in Colorado. That's the biggest energy user in our homes is building heat. And, uh, and something that always a, a natural gas fired high efficiency furnace for years and years was our go-to at Ewers Architecture. That's what we, that's what we wanted our, our, our clients to use. Water heat, another thing, you know, oh my gosh, we would never think of heating water using electricity. You know, those were, that was like taboo. Uh, we'd always want to use a high efficiency gas fired uh, water heater or possibly an on-demand water heater, which is gonna be natural gas also. Cooking, right? Everybody loves cooking with gas, right? That's, that's, uh, that's our go-to and that's, uh, uh, many of our clients say, don't make, don't make me give up my gas, my gas uh, uh, cooks, cooktop. I mean, I got to have that. And clothes dryers, even clothes dryers. So for years and years, it was always, we want that natural gas clothes dryer. Run that gas line to the, clothes, to the dryer. Don't worry about the 220 volt. These are the things that we typically use, nat for, uh, use natural gas for. I'm here to tell you, all of those things can be done better with electricity. So let's look at building heat. There is there our old system, right? How many people have a furnace like that down in the down in the basement? Ours looked just like that until a couple of years ago when we did replace it with a, uh, a high efficiency uh, natural gas. But uh, that's the old, and here's here's the new. This is a ground source heat pump. Okay, so what you're not seeing there are the three 300 foot holes in the ground uh, that are circulating the liquid that's flowing through that. But notice notice that. The, the new system doesn't, other, other than looking a little newer, it doesn't look any different than the old system, right? Uh, it still uh, creates heat and cool and, and uh, pumps it through the home, pumps it through your ducts. Uh, and that's, uh, that's kind of a theme throughout all these things. They look the same. They work better, just like the Tesla looks just like my old Prius, right? I mean, it's got four wheels. When you hit the, when they hit the accelerator, it goes. When you hit the brake, it stops. You know, it does all the things that a car is supposed to do. Well, this ground source heat pump does all the things that this old furnace and, and uh, maybe a, an AC unit outside would do, but it does it much, much more efficiently. One problem, same problem with my Tesla. It's expensive. This ground source heat pump is expensive. Right now you can get 30% uh, tax rebates if you get it installed by December 31st, 26% next year, 22% the year after that, and then 19% and then it goes away. So uh, it's an expensive system, tax cuts for it are going away. So we need to find ways to, uh, to, to heat and cool homes using electricity, but more uh, without, uh, without spending so much money. Not all of our clients can afford this system. When they can, it's great. It's the Cadillac. So 
What else can we do? Well, there's the mini split. A lot of people, I bet, have seen one of these hanging on a wall somewhere. It's a very efficient technology, all electric, has a coefficient of performance of around three or more, and it, uh, it uses an air source heat pump system. So it's very similar to the ground source heat pump, it's just an air source heat pump, all right? And there, there are some great things about it, uh, but what we've been focused on is a little bit so using the same technology, but it's available in some different formats now. So this is a little unit that sits up above a ceiling and drop the ceiling in the bathroom to seven feet or seven foot six, slide this, slide this up above it, and, uh, and you can duct it and duct it around the house. It's great for uh, our like accessory dwelling units, things like that that we're designing, uh, smaller, smaller uh, buildings. It's a great system, or just it can be just built right into the ceiling. It just looks like a vent in the ceiling, but that your whole uh, your the uh, the delivery for it is is right there. Now here's the best. This is one we haven't actually installed one of these yet, but but we're going to soon. This is a central unit, and it is a one-to-one -one replacement for that furnace that sits down in your basement. Uh, it is a mini split. It's that heat pump technology. And you can, you can replace an old furnace with that. So next time we're replacing our furnace, that's what's going in our house. And this is what sits outside for all of those systems. It's, it's a condensing unit, very much like a condensing unit that you'd have for, uh, for the old air conditioner, but it runs both ways. So it provides heat and cooling and uh, they are getting more and more and more efficient. So this technology we are trying to use, in fact, if you do go to the uh, Metro Denver uh, Green Homes Tour in October, uh, one of the homes that we have on the, on the tour, it's up in Golden Gate Canyon, is using this mini split technology, but it's using it uh, with, an, uh, with a water-based system. So it, they're running uh, radiant floor heat with it. And uh, uh, so uh, it is, we can use this uh, for a whole house. That, that house in Golden Gate Canyon is a very, very budget conscious house. Uh, and uh, so this is a great technology. It's not too expensive. We're looking for ways that we can build a, a net zero energy home without a cost premium. And we can do it. So just a little aside, I'm talking about residences, but I just wanted to throw in what an old rooftop unit on oh, so many of our commercial buildings look like, right? That's, if you've been up on a commercial roof, you've seen these things. That's the old. Well, the new is, uh, is a variable refrigerant flow system. It's basically a mini split on steroids at the commercial level. So that, that picture on the right is, is from our Renaissance school in Castle Rock. That's how, that's how we created an all electric school by using the VRF system and then can offset that uh, using photovoltaic panels. So same technology, uh, very similar technology and I'll touch on it a little bit, uh, little bit more uh, here in a few more slides. So water heating, um, like I said, Electric water heating used to be absolutely taboo. I would cringe at electric water heaters. Uh, so we would always want to use gas-fired water heaters. Well, this is a very old gas-fired water heater. If you look closely at the picture, the, line, the pipes are cut. We're taking that one out, but it's a picture I had in my, uh, available to me. The new water heaters are Stival Eltron or, or similar uh, heat pump water heater. So kind of that same mini split technology, but we're just bringing it right into the home. Uh, yes, it cools off the space that it's sitting in, but some of these actually now can be ducted also. So as you're creating the hot water, you're, you're, uh, you're uh, rejecting uh, cool air. And so if you can get that cool air and use that cool air in a way, that's even, even better. You need about 700 cubic feet of space, so don't put it in a really tight closet. But look again, the, the new water heater looks exactly like the old water heater, right? Our clients, they're just gonna go down in the basement and there's this round thing that creates hot water, cold water in, hot water out, just like they're used to in every house they've ever owned, right? They look the same, but they work better and they're more efficient. Okay, now let's get to a few that are a little more, uh, I don't know, harder, harder to get people sometimes to, uh, uh, to get away from. That, that old natural gas, this is, this is the stove in our house. I think I'm uh, heating up some beans there. I wanted to see that flame 
for the photograph. Uh, but uh, yeah, that natural gas uh, stovetop is what, I mean, that's what cooks want, right? You gotta, you gotta have the natural gas. Well, there are induction cooktops available now. I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir and probably a lot of you are already aware of this. Does anyone have an induction cooktop? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, like eight of you out there, that's great. So tell everyone around you how great it is. Does it, do, do any of you not like it? Any of you? Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard of anyone who has an induction cooktop that doesn't like it. So it, it's too fast. <laughs> oh my, <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I'd never say that about my Tesla. <laughs> I would never say it's too fast. Uh, so the induction cooktops, uh, instant on, instant off, just like the natural gas. Even better than natural gas, though, because when, when you're done cooking on it and you move the pan away, it's not really even too hot. So you don't have, you know, like my, my stovetop there, uh, once, I, once I turn the gas off, you know, the little metal parts still stay pretty hot. So uh, uh, check out the induction cooktops. They are the wave of the future, and as more and more people buy them, that price is gonna keep dropping with all these technologies, that's key. So as people who are really invested in this, we need to invest in that technology to help drive the pr price down so that other people will then invest in that technology. So then last, clothes drying, right? Always been told that natural gas clothes dryers are the most efficient. You don't wanna use electricity to, to heat your clothes. Okay, I'll give you, best is hang your clothes out outside. Yes, <laughs> but a lot of my clients are just not going to do that, uh, and inside. hang them out inside. On, okay, build yourself a solarium like Steve did, and hang your clothes in that. Uh, but there are uh, heat pump clothes dryers available now, and I read online they're a little bit glitchy, a little on the expensive side but they're coming about. So watch, the next time you need to replace your, your clothes dryer, think about a heat pump, uh, heat pump dryer. So the thing is that all of, these, uh, all of these heat pump technologies, they're all have a coefficient of performance, uh, of a coefficient of performance of greater than three. And that's kind of key because we know that the old electric power that we used was, it was about one third uh, efficient. So the coal or natural gas that they use at the power plant, they have to use about three times the, the raw energy in, of the power that you're going to get out of your plug at home, all right? Between the inefficiencies in generating the power and the line loss getting to your house, you've got about one third of the power that went into creating that. So natural gas is 100% efficient, right? Very little line loss. Yeah. Natural gas comes in, you burn it, you get 100% of the, of the efficiency, or 95% if you're talking a water heater uh, or a high efficiency furnace. So that, that coefficient of performance of three in electric, these new heat pump technologies, the new electric, uh, high efficiency electric units are now offsetting that one third uh, uh, reduction actually two-thirds reduction in power of the electricity that you're, that you're potentially using. However, the beautiful part is if you've got photovoltaic panels on your roof, you're almost, you're very close to 100% efficient on your electric power as well. So you take 100% efficiency or maybe 95% efficiency of your electric power and multiply that by the three of the coefficient of, of performance of your uh, high efficiency electric units, and now you are uh, you're like that Tesla, you have far surpassed anything uh, that has come before. And that's, that's where we need to get to. That's the excitement. That's why we're living in such an exciting time that we get to do that, that past generations haven't. And we've got to lead the way for the future generations. So real quick, I'll touch on a few other technologies that we look to to help us create net zero energy buildings. Things that are available now, high performance windows, ERVs, uh, VRFs, which I showed a little bit of, and aero barrier. Let me just quickly show you these four things. So super efficient windows, these are Alpen windows. They're made right here in Colorado. Uh, they have a fantastic window that gets to an unbelievable R value of 11. That's a U value of 0.09. They have some other, other uh, uh, window uh, lines that are not quite that efficient, but still uh, very, very efficient way beyond anything that we could have dreamed of even 10 years ago. 
Uh, Zola is another, uh, another manufacturer. They're out of Poland. Uh, so they got to ship them. They take a little while to get here, but fantastic. Uh, European windows are making inroads into the U.S. market at, at, a, at a great rate. They're a little on the expensive side, but uh, the, the uh, uh, performance that you get out of them is, uh, is just beyond anything we could have imagined. So energy recovery ventilators. So uh, these are... Uh, uh, very, very important to put into our sustainable homes because we're building those homes so tight that uh, the air inside is going to quickly get stale. We don't have, in my home that was built in 1889, I don't really worry too much about having fresh air. There are so many cracks in that house that we got plenty of fresh air. Uh, yeah, I'm going to worry. I'm, I'm going to work on sealing that up. But, um, but with, with our new homes, we are building them so tight that we need fresh air. And so ERVs, energy recovery ventilators, exhaust the air from the home while bringing in fresh air and transferring the heating or cooling that is, uh, that is being exhausted into that incoming air. So very, very important to, to get those installed. Uh, HRVs, the heat recovery ventilator, is a similar, similar animal. It just uh, it does not uh, deal with... Uh, with moisture, with the, with the uh, humidity in the air. So uh, you're losing a little bit of, of, uh, of the, uh, the benefit of that outgoing air. So ERVs uh, are both heat and humidity and, and cooling. And then uh, what we like is uh, when, when we can afford to use this, this build equinox system, it's a CERV, they call it, it's a conditioning ERV. And so not only is it a super efficient uh, energy recovery ventilator, but it also has a little uh, heat pump technology built right in to boost that air uh, up or down as well. So a great, great system. Uh, variable re re refrigerant flow, this is the same picture I showed earlier. I just want to add to that one of the great things about VRFs when we're designing commercial buildings is that uh, they have additional technology, uh, computer, computer driven technology. Uh, when you're designing a big building or you have a large building where there might be heat called for in one part of the building and cooling called for in another part of the building, the VRFs can just send that heat and cooling back and forth without even having to go to this outside unit and, and, and fire up that heat pump technology. So without even using the heat pump, they're cooling one part of the building and heating another part of the building. So they're getting a coefficient of performance of seven and greater when it's operating in that mode. Really helps us with our net zero energy buildings. Now this is a, a great product and uh, I have uh, a client here tonight that's having this installed in their home that's being built uh, in the next month or so, right? The, this should be, should be sprayed in. Uh, Aero Barrier is a, a technology that uh, it's taken from, uh, from duct sealing. It's a duct sealing technology, uh, but they spray it into the entire building, into the entire home while it's under construction, and it seals up every little crack. So, and, and uh, they can, you tell them how, how tight you want your home and they just keep that running until it's that tight. And you, know, you see the dollar bills going as they're, as they're spraying too. So at some point you gotta say, stop, that's good enough. But uh, they can seal cracks up to a half inch. Now, does that mean that you can build a really, really crummy home with a lot of cracks in it and then just bring in arrow barrier? Well, yeah, sort of, but it's kind of like that uh, you got to do all the first things right and then use, uh, then use uh, that, this technology. Uh, you want to get things as tight as you can and then bring an arrow barrier to finish it off for you and, uh, and really seal those up. So great technology. Uh, if you want to see it being sprayed in in the next month, uh, uh, let me know. I'm not sure we might. I think we're going to have a crowd there that day uh, watching it. It's a pretty new technology. Uh, if you want to see it after it's sprayed, come to the Solar Home Tour or the uh, Metro Denver Green Homes Tour. Uh, it, that home under construction is going to be on the tour. And so those are available now. So what's coming soon? This is the exciting stuff. You know, we live in such a changing time. There are great technologies coming about like vacuum sealed panels and PV built into other building materials and the battery technology keeps getting better and better, right? So vacuum sealed panels, this is actually available now only for floors or roofs, not for walls, uh, but it's R28 in a one inch panel, R57 in a two inch panel. 
So using vacuum sealing like in a thermos, they're starting to create building materials out of this same technology. We can, now we don't have to have, uh, you know, we typically be doing a 10 or 12 inch thick wall in a lot of our, uh, a lot of our sustainable homes. This, uh, looking forward to being able to use thinner, thinner walls. Uh, and solar panels, uh, we're always designing, you know, where can you put them? On the roof, over the parking? How are we gonna get enough solar panels? Well, it's being built into other building materials like exterior, exterior walls. This is a white solar panel, uh, solar uh, uh, PV built, built into windows. Uh, all that stuff is coming about. So uh, how soon it's gonna get here, I can't say, but, uh, but I'm, I'm ready for it. Battery technology. Uh, I'm not an expert in battery technology. I bet we have some, some people here that know way more than I do, but it is changing and it is an exciting time. They are uh, you know, emerging technologies that are making our batteries more and more efficient and charge faster. And there's even more. We're looking forward to more improved mini split technology, a black box, which is like a CRV that can, uh, CERV that can uh, provide all the heating and cooling and fresh air to the home in one, in one unit. People are working on this. Uh, it's somewhat available out there. Uh, not ready for prime time yet, but uh, improved automation technologies. I think this is a big one. You know, there are so many cool things that we can do with automation, but it's still, in my opinion, it's for people who are really techie and want to play with that stuff. We've got to make our automation technology easy to use for even, you know, I don't know, my mother, uh, you know, uh, my wife, she says. <laughs> uh, so uh, solar gardens, I talked about, we're anxiously awaiting the golden solar garden. Uh, DC power grid has been talked about. How awesome would that be if we're shipping DC power around the country? Uh, I'm looking forward to an electric uh, uh, supercharger network for cars uh, so that I can go uh, drive 300 miles, sit down, have a bite to eat, and an hour later come out and my car is fully charged again and I'm ready to take off for another 300 miles. That would make, uh, make electric automobiles so much easier uh, to use for so many more people. And there are many more technologies that we haven't even thought of yet. So our world is changing, right? We know that. We are no longer under the Prius effect. We, are, we have got to move to the Tesla effect. The next generation of power must belong to electricity and electricity must belong to renewables. If we as a nation and as a world can use 100% renewable electric energy, then we have a future. And that future is available today. We must hit the accelerator and make sure we get there as soon as possible. Then, we can laugh like a little kid and feel the exhilaration that we just saved the earth. Let's do that. Thank you. So I just want to wrap it up with a few more words. I'm almost there. We have the technology and knowledge now to create high efficiency, high comfort, low energy consumption, all electric systems and buildings. We have electricity providers creating electricity using renewable energy and minimizing fossil fuels with a future of 100% renewable electricity flowing through our electric grid. We must take advantage of our electric future and integrate all electric systems in our buildings now. So we are ready for our future. Thank you.